and today for First Chapter Friday we are reading Out of the Dust and this one is a little different so it's not technically first chapter um, but I'll read the first 10 pages. This is written in free verse poems so as you see <clears throat> they look more like diary entries and it's called free verse. So uh, it's a quick read and I'll start with the inside cover. Here we go. Out of the Dust by Karen Hazy. At 14, Billy Jo has a great deal to forgive. Her father for causing the accident that killed her mother. Her mother for leaving Billy Jo when she needed her most. And she must forgive herself for being the cause of her own sorrow. Daddy's too wrung out to help Billy Jo much, and there's no one else to care. So Billy Jo must heal herself, even if it means tearing up her roots and leaving behind everything she's ever known. Set in Oklahoma Dust Bowl during the Great Depression, Karen Hazy's spare and moving novel explores both the ecology of the land and the topography of her heart. All right, here we go. So again, um, I'll read the first 10 pages. Out of the Dust. Winter, 1934. Beginning, August, 1920. As summer wheat came ripe, so did I. Born at home on the kitchen floor, Ma crouched barefoot, bare bottom, over the swept boards because that's where Daddy said it'd be best. I came too fast for the doctor, bawling as soon as Daddy wiped his hand around the inside of my mouth. To hear Mom tell it, I hollered myself red that day I was born. Red's the color I've stayed ever since. Daddy named me Billy Joe. He wanted a boy. Instead, he got a long-legged girl with a wide mouth and cheekbones like bicycle handles. He got a red-headed, freckle-faced, narrow-hipped girl with a fondness for apples and a hunger for playing fierce piano. From the earliest I can remember, I've been restless in this little panhandle shack we call home, always getting in Ma's way with my pointy elbows my fidgety legs. By the summer I turned nine, Daddy had given up about having a boy. He tried making me do. I look just like him. I can handle myself most everywhere he puts me even on the tractor, though I don't like that much. Ma tried having other babies. It never seemed to go right, except with me. But this morning, Ma let on as how she's expecting again. Other than the three of us, there's not much family to speak of. Daddy, the only Kelby left since Grandpa died from a cancer that ate up most of his skin, and Aunt Ellis, almost 14 years older than Daddy, and living in Lubbock, a ways south from here and a whole world apart to hear Daddy tell it. And Ma, with only great Uncle Floyd, old as ancient Indian bones, and mean as a rattler, rotting away in the room down in Dallas. I'll be nearly 14, just like Aunt Alice was when Daddy was born, by the time the baby comes. Wonder if Daddy, Daddy will finally get his boy this time. January 1934. Rabbit Battles. Mr. Noble and Mr. Romney have a bet going as to who can kill the most rabbits. It all started at the rabbit drive last Monday over to Sturgis, when Mr. Noble got himself worked up about the damage done to his crop by Jacks. Mr. Romney swore he had had more rabbit trouble than anyone in Camoran County. They pledged revenge on the rabbit population, wagering who could kill more. They ought to just shut up. Betting on how many rabbits they kill? Honestly, grown men clubbing bunnies to death makes me sick to my stomach. I know rabbits eat what they shouldn't, especially this time of year when they could hop halfway to liberal and still not find food. But Miss Freeland says if we keep plowing under the stuff they ought to be eating, what are they supposed to do? Mr. Noble and Mr. Romney came home from Sturges Monday when 20 rabbits with 20 rabbits apiece. A tie. It should have stopped there, but Mr. Ro Romney wasn't satisfied. He said, Noble cheated. He brought in rabbits somebody else killed. And so the contest goes. Those men, they used to be friends. Now they can't be civil with each other. They scowl as they pass on the street. I'm scowling too, but scowling won't bring the rabbits back. They're all skinned and cooked and eaten by now. At least they didn't end up in the Romney and Noble's cook pots. They went to families that needed the meat. January 1934. Losing Livy. Livy Killian moved away. I didn't want her to go. We'd been friends since first grade. 
The farewell party was Thursday night at the old rock schoolhouse. Livy had something to tease each of us about, like Ray sleeping through reading class and Hillary, who on her speed te- her speed writing test put an even ton of children instead of an even ten. <clears throat> Livy said goodbye to each of us separately. She gave me a picture she'd made of me sitting in front of the piano wearing my straw hat, an apple halfway to my mouth. I handed Livy the memory book we'd all filled with our different slants. I couldn't get the muscles in my throat relaxed enough to tell her how much I'd miss her. Livy helped clear Livy helped clean up her own party, wiping spilled lemonade, gathering sandwich crusts, sweeping cookie crumbs from the floor, while the rest of us went home to study for the semester reviews. Now Libby's gone west, out of the dust, on her way to California, where the wind takes a rest sometimes. And I'm wondering what kind of friend I am, wanting my feet on that road to another place instead of Libby's. January 1934. Me and Mad Dog. Arlie Wanderdale, who teaches music once a week at our school, though Ma says she's no teacher at all, just a local song plugger. Arlie Arlie Wanderdale asked if I'd like to play a piano solo at the Palace Theater on Wednesday night. I grinned, pleased to be asked, and said, that'd be all right. I didn't know if mom would let me. She is an old mule on the subject of my schooling. She says, you stay home on weeknights, Billy Joe, and mostly that's what I do. But Arlie Wanderdale said, the management asked me to bring them talent, Billy Joe, and I thought of you. Even before Mad Dog Craddock, I wondered, you and Mad Dog, Arlie Wanderdale said, Darn that blue-eyed boy with his fine face and smooth voice, twice as good as a plowboy has any right to be. I suspect a mad dog had come first to Arlie Wanderdale's mind, but I didn't get too riled. Not so riled, I couldn't say yes. January 1934. So again, that was the first ten pages, because this is written in free verse. Um, First ten pages of Out of the Dust. Teachers, check out the links below.